The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 28th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat upon it. His appearance was like lightning, his raiment white as snow. For fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. For I know that you seek Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. Lo, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Hail! They came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that you have completed your work through the gift of your Son in bringing salvation to the world. We pray that you would guide us by your Spirit now, call us to attention, turn our hearts and our minds to you and your Word, help us to learn your will through it, and give us strength by your Spirit to do it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. I would expect that everybody in here has had a loss. I mean, a personal, private loss. Somebody who you knew and loved and cared about. You remember that feeling, what it was like, especially in the early days? As events went on, perhaps fully for that full year uh, after their death and separation, you were thinking to yourself, this will be a holiday, this will be an event when they won't be there. I mean, it causes an ache sometimes, a real disappointment within us. We almost want to wake up in the morning and believe that it was a nightmare and that we're back together as a family. I wonder how the disciples were feeling with Jesus. I mean, they, they didn't just know him in a, in a sermon once in a while or get fed on a hillside once in a while. They had committed themselves to Jesus. They left their jobs. They left their families. They left everything else in their lives and followed him. Every day was a little different. Not what they expected at all. But they were on the cusp. They were on the leading edge. Every once in a while, you heard the complaints of the scribes or the Pharisees because of what day Jesus healed or what he said or what he did. The disciples lived with him for three years. After a while, I would expect that they saw enough of the power of God in him. Oh, perhaps stilling a storm or calling someone to life who had been dead four days. That would tend to do it. So they recognized tremendous power and wisdom. And when he preached, it wasn't just powerful sermons. It was sermons with authority. He wasn't quoting some rabbi somewhere. He was talking about what the will of God was. Almost as if he had a relationship with the Father. Others did not. That, in fact, was a request of one of the disciples, Philip. If you will just show us the Father, we'll be satisfied. We don't need to see anything else. You have a connection that we're still missing. We don't even have to know how to pray. We're asking you to teach us how to pray. They had been committed. They had been involved. They had been enthused. They were ready. And there it was, Palm Sunday. 
about 50,000 extra people on the hillsides outside of Jerusalem and marching into Jerusalem, and expectations were high, not just from the crowds, that this was the son of David, the son of God, but from the disciples. I expect they were not clear what had changed. But it was Jesus who always told people to be quiet, who is now healing people in the midst of the crowds. Everyone knew who he was. And then, then it was Good Friday. Then it was that Friday when Jesus is crucified. The impact on their lives, what do they do now? How do they go back home and talk to their Jewish friends? How do they go back and explain to their parents where they've been for three years? How do they find their way back into the synagogue? For they would have been thrown out like the others who identified with Jesus. It would be disastrous were it not for today. The day we remember the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. They may have wondered what went so wrong. When the loss was there, how did it happen? Somebody that they knew to be the most loving person they had ever met, bringing all that he had and all that he was to the care of other people, ends up being crucified. Well, we have to defend them a little bit. Maybe they they were not really focused as they could have been had they had the Lutheran liturgy. As far as I know, I think it was developed a little after that. But, But we know... We know the answer to the question, why did this happen? Because sin doesn't change. Lots of things have changed in the last 2,000 years, but not sin. Sin works the same way in us that it would work in Pilate or the Jewish leaders or the disciples themselves. What do we say week after week, at least in some of our liturgy? I confess that I am a slave. I have sinned, and therefore, Jesus says, I am a slave. I cannot break myself free. I am in bondage to sin. Now, we ought to keep that in mind, because otherwise we'll have no need for Christ and Him going to the cross for us. If we keep in the back of our mind a feeling as if if we really focused on it, I mean, if we really gave attention to this or that particular sin, we could stop. We can stop smoking anytime we want. Done that four times, my dad used to say. Yep, gave up smoking four times. Started up again, you know, but we could stop. Well, no, we can't. We're in bondage to sin, and that sin is pervasive. I mean, that's what we continue to confess. Uh, I'm in bondage to sin. I have sinned against you by thought, word, and deed. Is there any other part of your life? What, let me think, when, when else would there be? In our thoughts, when we say something, when we do something, sin finds its way into our lives. Sin will work so hard at us that whether we're doing something or not doing something, it's always the wrong something. Sins of omission and commission. Well, I didn't hit the kid, I didn't help him, but I, I, at least, isn't there a difference? Isn't that guy worse than me? No. So when sin confronts Jesus, there's a goal in mind, and that is to stop that one who is the Son of God. So the impact of sin, it brings about his death. It isn't just the Jews. It isn't just the Romans. It's the disciples themselves. They are totally devastated by what they saw happen. After all of their commitment, after all their following Jesus, when it gets to the end, even with forewarning by Jesus, they will betray him and deny him and flee. It's Jesus alone on the cross. And if it were not for Easter, all would be lost. There'd be a footnote in some theological journal somewhere about a guy named Jesus who came out of Palestine and uh, started a movement which failed because in the end they killed him. Jesus said, this is the plan. I must go to the cross. I must be betrayed, suffer, and die, and on the third day rise. All of that is necessary. The disciples objected to the idea of him being betrayed or beaten or, or, or 
or any of those things, but they often forgot. By the time he got to talk about the necessity of the resurrection, he was preparing St. Paul. Remember what St. Paul said? This Easter is not just one holiday among many. I mean, I will ask that with confirmation kids. What's the most important holiday of the church here? You know, every, every time some kid will say Christmas, you know, it's got more presents to it, I guess. It calls their attention. Because if Jesus wasn't born, you know, if Jesus were just born, he would have been a Jewish guy who died 2,000 years ago. St. Paul, the great Pharisee, says, if Christ was not raised, what happens? Our faith is in vain. We are wasting our time. That's why the disciples are proudly and boldly saying, I saw him, I touched him, I ate with him. 500 of the brethren at one time met with Jesus. Why do they have to emphasize this? Because you can't see him now. To understand Jesus coming and his death, we need to understand his resurrection. It is necessary for me to suffer and die for you to live. For you to have forgiveness for your sin. Working the law is not going to work it. The law will now show you your sin, but I will deal with it. I will be that Lamb of God who goes to the cross to die so that you might have forgiveness. Not just you, but anyone who calls on the name of the Lord. Here we are 2,000 years later asking forgiveness in His name. By the blood of Christ, we receive the grace. How would we know that it matters? How do we know that, that His death means anything to us except that the Father raised Him from the dead? Now think about it. It is one thing that Jesus has this extraordinary power and he heals people and he feeds people and he still storms and he raises the dead. But when that person with the power dies, what happens? Now if that power was from God, the stamp of approval, the indicator of the Father that, that my son has done according to the plan, for your sake, is to bring him to life again. Those disciples were pretty disappointed in each other. I expect, like anybody else, they would have pointed the blame at someone else. You know, that stupid Judas, you know. And then they begin to think to themselves, could they have said something? Should they have said something? Were there hints? Were there indicators that Judas was not to be trusted? Why entrust him the, the treasury of the disciples? They have hints, the complaints, the words, he was looking funny. This division is in the world. It's in our families. It's in our marriages. It's in our churches. It's in the world. We see it. We're on the brink all the time. That division will bring about the separation of Jesus from his disciples. It will bring him to the cross. What does the resurrection do? Brings us to Christ. We, we said it. He, he is risen. He is risen indeed. The excitement there is not just about Jesus having life again, but us having life together in community. Now, our way to the Father, only through Christ, will bring us to one another. We will be connected in the body of Christ around the world and back through history. We are a cloud of witnesses. We are part of that body of Christ with Christ alone as the head. He is the one who leads us. He is the one who empowers us. Risen from the dead, now the church is not in Jerusalem, it is not in Jacksonville, in this place alone, but everywhere where Christ's name is called. Where we meet in His name, He promised to be with us. I mean, that's what He said. I mean, that is an odd, grandiose statement. I'll be with you to the end of the age and then disappears. The risen Lord Jesus says, I will be with you where two or three gather, I will give you my body and blood. I will be present with you forever. 
Nothing will separate you. The risen Lord says with all of His power, nothing will separate us. And so, there it is. The gift of community that comes with Easter. If there were anything Jesus was known for, it was His love. I mean, He he loved His enemies. He loved those people who were putting Him on the cross. He taught His disciples about love. A different love. Not, not a stronger human love, but a divine love. I don't want you to try harder to do your family love. That will wear out. It'll make it impossible for you to love an enemy because he's not in your family. But I want you to love the way I have loved you. Divine love. That's what disciples are called to. And that power of loving that way comes with the risen Lord Jesus. You don't have the power. You have to wait. But when the Spirit comes, my Spirit comes. I have to go or I can't send Him, but I will send that Spirit, and then you will have power. It'll be power to love even your enemies, to forgive someone who sins against you seven times in the same day. If we understand the community that Christ is building because He is risen from the dead and the power that He sends Jesus had power to heal. Sin takes that away. He doesn't stay around that long. Forty days and he ascends into the heavens. What about the need of those people who are sick, who are lame and blind and hungry and thirsty? I will let you do more than I did. There will be more of you. There will be billions of you. Imagine if he had said it back then. Well, it's going to be a while. It's going to take a while. We're going to take a couple of thousand years, but there will be billions of you scattered around the world. And I want you to bring that love and that word of mine and that healing. That that healing. No, no, I'm not asking you to be a doctor. I am asking you to look at the life that I'm offering where dis-ease is done away with. That's the gift that Jesus brings. The disciples kept struggling with people who would come all the time for healing and, and, and Jesus would say, don't tell anyone, that isn't the focus. The life that I want to offer you is eternal life. The eternal life that the Father will give you through me. That's the blessing of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says it, risen from the dead. I have the power and I will not let you go. There are saints that have gone before us, and we will see them again. The one who promised that is the Lord Jesus himself. So he taught his disciples, brought them the word of truth. No matter what someone else says, this word of truth guides the disciples of Jesus. We look to him, we listen to him, and believe what he says. So that Holy Spirit that has come is the one who teaches us. And that's what he said wasn't just so we would have the ability to speak in tongues or or heal or do miracles or interpret tongues. It was more than that. It was so that we would understand Him. That that word He proclaimed would now be taught by the Holy Spirit. And that word that we know would be words that we share with others. What was it Paul said in that epistle lesson? We've got to change our focus. We're not looking for him here. He's not in a tour group over in Jerusalem. He is in the heavens. Seek what is above. Look to the one who is above at the right hand of the Father. So when the challenge comes and the sickness comes and death nears, our focus better be him. We're those brothers and sisters of Stephen who in the midst of his martyrdom, being stoned to death, sees Jesus at the right hand of the Father. The risen Lord Jesus ascended, now praying for us. Praying for the world. Praying that we would go out as faithful witnesses and bring the light that he has given us into the darkness of the world. This is the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And because of that, we have the promises sure I pray the Lord would bless you and me as we live our lives in Christ, baptized into his son, into his death, so that as Christ was raised from the